Shanti Shanti comes several times, such as uh, in this in these ten Shanti mantras, it comes ten times. So uh, 
usually the last Om Shanti 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 is pronounced as Om Shanti Shanti Vishwa Shanti. And uh, maybe we can change it in this one as well. Maybe. Yes. So the last one, ah, okay. the, the tenth one, we can have uh, okay. Vishwa Shanti there. And uh, when we pronounce like this, we can always, uh, the, the, the last one, uh, the one that we pronounce, so for example, today we pronounced the fourth one as the last one, we can pronounce it as Vishwa Shanti. Is it brings us to this idea of world peace which is inherently present in the Vedic teachings that may there be peace in the whole world around us. <coughs> this was one thing that I wanted to add and uh, the second thing that I wanted to add uh, to our previous discussion when the word Prishtha came you know, for back. I could not remember the name, uh, the names of the asanas which use the word prishtha. And the reason was that uh, mostly in, uh, in the Iyengar style of naming asanas, we use the word paschima instead of prishtha for back. So such as paschimottanasana. You know, or uh, Paschima Namaskara. There we use the word Paschima. But uh, sometimes some of, some of the asana names are common to all traditions, but some of the asana names are different in different traditions. And uh, some of the asanas also are not included, were not uh, included by Guruji in, uh, in the light, in light on yoga. So, for some reason, either, for different reasons, I, I don't know. But uh, there are at least three asana names which clearly use the word prishtha. Prishthasana, Meru Prishthasana, and Uttana Prishthasana. Uh, I think uh, Prishthasana looks very much, uh, I think we practice it here also, you know, when. When, when you do Prasarita Padottanasana with your uh, both feet, legs apart, and if you just bow forward with your hands stretched out, but staying there, not, not going down, staying there, that is what they call Prishthasana, because it's, you are really stretching uh, the back. Uttana Prishthasana, I, I also don't know, it's, in English they usually translate it as the lizard pose. And I tried to find it uh, in light on yoga, but I, I could not find it. But it's, uh, yeah, it's very much like Virabhadrasana too, but stretching completely forward. But what we do, we stretch forward in Virabhadrasana 3. So if you would do the same thing in Virabhadrasana 2, that you would stretch forward, then that is what they call uh, Uttana Prashtasana. So again, this we, we don't practice. And Meru Prashthasana, I this this just occurred to me at the end of while I was just walking down, so I quickly checked on the internet. But Meru Prashthasana, I, I didn't check, so I and since I never practiced. But the name is there, and it comes uh, to my mind. So the asana is there, but I don't know. I don't know how how it looks like. But, uh, on the internet. But the names are there. The names are in the. In, the, in, the, in, in several, uh, for example, if you look uh, at Gita Presa's Yoga uh, Anka, which lists all the different asanas, it is there. And from there it comes to the yoga. You remember once we went to, to that Ayurvedic Institute in Raiwala, uh -huh. we bought a book which has uh, several ancient uh, Hindi and Sanskrit verses describing several asanas. So many of them come from there. No, I don't. Uh, that, that book should be somewhere in, in my library still, but uh, I, I don't have to find it. I think just traditional wisdom. 
and the practitioners of yoga, several different schools. The Shivananda school has it. Uh, uh, you, you know that, uh, what is that one? So famous in Australia. Yoga in daily life. Uh, they also have these asanas. <coughs> In several asanas, Guruji left out because uh, he felt that they don't have a desired effect on the body or not, or not, because uh, he did a lot of research, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to see. Yeah, ask why Uttana, why Lizard pose is not taught in the anger tradition. Yeah, I will find that out. But just to clarify that I was not wrong <laughs> when I just out of the blue mentioned that the word prishta is used in several asana names. I was not wrong. <laughs> You're not teaching something wrong. <laughs> So, coming back to the discussion that we were having, on the fourth mantra, the mantra in which we see the, ex we see the exclamations of sage Trishanku, a sage who had a past, filled with negativity but it is his sadhana, his practice and then his experience is what helped him to raise beyond the guilt of those past deeds, those past atrocities that he had committed and he found peace within himself. Such sages, such saints are abundant in number in ancient uh, Indian traditions. Another great name that uh, comes to my mind is a female devotee, mystic, whatever we want to call her. Her name was Pingala. Pingala, that was her name. Pingala? Pingala. Like Ida and Pingala. Yeah, like Ida and Pingala. So it's, it was a common uh, uh, girl name in ancient India. There are several Pingalas in Indian, ancient Indian mythological stories. And uh, <coughs> this one was uh, from Mithila. Mithila is. Uh, a kingdom in, now located in area around northern Bihar, the area which uh, the, the state where the Buddha and Mahavira, both of them were born. So Mithila, it's also the city where Sita, the consort and wife of Rama, was born. She was the, the princess of Mithila. In the last past 500 or 1,000 years, that area has produced some of the greatest logicians uh, in Indian philosophy. So it was really the, the fort of the, in Indian traditions, it is considered the fort of logical studies, logical analysis, a very analytical, logical approach. And uh, it is an extremely ancient city. Uh, the king of Mithila, Janaka, is often comes occurs in the Upanishads as a student of Seji Adyavalkya. So the city already existed in the Upanishadic times. And Pingala, this woman, she is a prostitute. She was a prostitute from uh, the city of Mithila. The city of the city of Mithila was also considered a very uh, very special in ancient India because many of its kings were very wise men in the sense that they were 
jnanis, they, they, were, they, they were masters of this wisdom of the self. So they were great scholars, they were great mystics. They were what they call Rajarshi, you know, Rishi wise men as kings. So she was a prostitute who they say raised herself up from bottomless loneliness to absolute happiness. And uh, the story occurs in, uh, in the 11th book of the Bhagavatam where uh, the story goes that she's waiting for her, she's waiting out of her mansion for somebody to come. But no one comes. She waits and waits and waits. Ultimately, she, the story goes that she reaches a state of realization in which she realizes that the beloved that I am waiting for is not to be found somewhere out there, but the beloved which gives the greatest amount of happiness, which gives the greatest amount of joy, which gives the greatest amount of satisfaction, and the greatest amount of wealth, is not to be found somewhere out there, and is not to be waited for out there, but is to be found within ourselves. And then she, she's sitting there, stops waiting for anyone and exclaims a beautiful uh, collection of verses which have been collected in the Bhagavatam. These verses are extremely beautiful because some of, one of that verse is that Santam Samipe, that beloved, is so close to my heart, Ramanam. He is my beloved. Radhi Pradam gives me tremendous joy. Vitta Pradam gives me all the wealth that I need. And we will see this also here when uh, Trishanku speaks about finding wealth, the luminous wealth within himself. And casting aside this beloved which is present within myself, I am in search for vain of someone who fulfills my desires only momentarily and only gives me happiness for a few moments, gives me a little bit of wealth which lasts for a short while and then ends only in suffering, fear, grief and ignorance. Wasn't I foolish till now that I was waiting and searching for something so impermanent? And then he says, then, then she ends this by saying that, Suhrit, I have found my best friend, Prishthadamaha, my greatest beloved, Nath Atma, who is the Lord of my soul. And it is not only the Lord of my soul, but the Lord of all living entities, Tam Vikriya Atmanaivaham, and I have won it, I have acquired it by selling away myself, which means by giving away my ego, my limited ego, by offering myself. I have acquired it. Ramenena Yatha Rama. And now I enjoy myself in his presence like the wife of Vishnu the goddess of wealth, who is the consort of Vishnu. So, and in this moment of awakening is standing there a young child of a Brahmin who just happened to witness this event happening and he is Adi Guru. He became Adi Guru Dattatreya the first master, Dattatriya, who is widely uh, worshipped in India and uh, his, uh, how do you say, 
footmark, mark of his both feet, are still footprints. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the word. Footprints are still present the, uh, in Gujarat on top of uh, a mountain in Junagar, where every uh, day thousands and thousands of pilgrims travel up around uh, 1,200. Oh, no, no, or 12,000, I don't remember now. It's something with 12, either 1,200 or 12,000 steps to reach the top of that mountain and uh, have a, just pray and worship those footprints of Adi Guru He had 24 masters and she was his last 24th master. And so she's also a similar character and uh, they say that this awakening came to her because she she always I mean she was she was a very nice person and a very deeply devoted person she used to constantly she had uh, these several uh, how do you call them you know birds at home you know like uh, parrots. parrots yes like parrots and she used to teach them the names of the divine so by teaching them the names of the divine she used to pronounce those names themselves and then used to hear them pronouncing it in her home so that is how her life slowly and slowly transformed and suddenly when she was sitting there out of her home and waiting for her what you can call clients, she suddenly experiences this moment of insight which transformed her life completely. There was a radical transformation as a result of that. And we find such transformations uh, amongst the bhaktas, among several great devotees in the stories of several great masters in India, for example, even in the life of the Buddha, Anguli Mala, the one who killed so many people that, uh, and he used to collect their fingers mm -hmm. and made a, a mala necklace mm -hmm. which he used to wear around. Uh, and like this he had uh, more than a hundred or thousand, th a necklace of thousands of fingers around him. And, uh, his life from such tremendous violence into becoming a disciple of the Buddha, you know, or Amrabali, again, a prostitute who was one of the first uh, female disciples of the Buddha. Such stories are abundant in all the different traditions. <coughs> The point is here, what we are studying, is that this experience which Prashanku has and which someone like Pingala had enabled them to transcend the guilt of having committed what they should not have done and having not done what they should have done. This is one thing that is very important because you see, guilt certainly has some practical use if it stops us from doing something <laughs> harmful again. We do something harmful, something harmful to ourselves, something harmful to the society. That is its practical use. But beyond that, it is something it is not only useless but it is detrimental it is very harmful because it, it first of all it overshadows our peace and if we have resolved that we will not commit the mistake again again human resolutions you know, resolution by a human being how trustworthy that is, no one knows. But still, once we have resolved, and there is a fair good 
possibility that we will not commit the mistake again, then raising above from such detrimental guilt is tremendously important. And particularly after moments of such moments of deep insight and such moments of radical transformation, after that, when a person, radical transformation in this case simply means one's life to be filled with love, with unconditional love for all by finding that bliss and source of love within one's heart. That is what this radical transformation. When the jnani, the jnana yogi, jnana yogis refer to it as I, the devotees refer to it as you. The difference, does, the difference of words doesn't matter. But when that source of love is found within and our whole life is permeated, soaked, saturated by that love, then after that, even a little bit of guilt, and then everything that we do is inspired by that love, then there is no point on harboring such guilt. And that is why the masters, the Upanishadic masters, so often, for example, in one of the Upanishads, one find that uh, someone who has become aware of that inner source of bliss, then he, he or she doesn't get tormented by ideas that why have I not done what I should have done and why have I done what I should have not done. Such thoughts don't even come. Or another example that we find in the Upanishads very often is that uh, such a human being then becomes like the leaf of a lotus plant, you know, where if a drop of water falls, it just trickles away. Similarly, if even a negative thought comes because he or she has learned to become a witness to it, to be, in, to be non-judgmental and indifferent to its present, its present. If the thought comes, fine. I don't have to act on it. The thought does not. I'm just a witness. When I identify with that thought and I say that as long as I say this is my thought, it is fine. But then when I deeply identify and say that this thought has come to me and that's why I'm contaminated by this thought, that is where the problem comes. If we don't engage with it, if we just allow it to be, it comes. And every someone who has come into a room will also go out. If we engage with it, it stops, it lingers a little bit longer. The moment we say good thought, bad thought, negative thought, positive thought, we have started engaging it. And when we start engaging it, it stays, it st it stays longer. Otherwise, it just trinkles away like water on a lotus leaf. It doesn't, it doesn't make it wet doesn't make us wet. <clears throat> this idea comes occurs in the in the in the Upanishads and also in the Bhagavad Gita, in the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Padma Patra, like the lotus leaf, leaf of the lotus flower. Another word that uh, the masters used to use for ancient, and we still use, for example, for Dattatriya, we use the word Avadhuta. Quite, if you have studied a little bit uh, of Indian spirituality, you will have come across this word Avadhuta. Avadhuta simply means someone who has, who, who shakes off all the dust. You know, like a horse. Usually the example that is given is like a horse, you know, after a horse. Yeah. Or, or even, a, even a, a, a dog. 
does it like a dog or a horse. You know? After they, they sometimes, I used to see earlier when in my childhood when uh, uh, in place of this taxi stand, there used to be a horse chariot stand. Then uh, during the day, sometimes these horse chariot drivers used to bring the horse to the Ganga and uh, they would drink a little bit of water from the Ganga. And uh, then there used to be a lot of sand all here. This was, all this area was filled with sand. Now, in place of this sand, this sand has been used to construct all these big buildings in Rashidish. But back then there used to be a lot of sand, so these horses, after they had drunk their water, they loved to, I don't know how you call it, they used to uh, huh? roll. Yeah in the sand, and after they had rolled a few times in the sand, they would stand up and then <laughs> shake off the sand and then again go back for their work. So that is what an avadhuta, someone who shakes off all the dust, of the dust in this case means the impressions impressed by past deeds. That's the dust which sticks to us because the deeds have been committed and now the impressions are there. They are which make us restless, suffering because they come up as memories and particularly the older we become. In younger age it's not so evident but I've spoken to so many old people who particularly after their 70s, they this is their description that they say that all our life starts coming in front of our eyes very much like a movie. Everything, everything that we have done starts coming back to us. And in those moments, if uh, someone who has uh, committed atrocious deeds, they can be tremendously upsetting to such a person. And uh, that's why post-traumatic disorders and uh, some people, due to such experiences, they commit even, so many people commit suicide, so many, or they at least go into depression. In those moments, it is important to find a way to raise beyond that, so that one finds peace within, them, within themselves. And this is what is happening to Trishanku in this Vedana Vajana in this explanation of experience. <clears throat> the point is that neither we should stigmatize ourselves nor there is any point in stigmatizing others simply because someone has done something in the past that doesn't matter and should never mean that the person is evil even today. Neither are we evil because deep down every human being as uh, sage Trishanku stated here, Urdhva Pavitra. I am pure, not only pure myself but pure to such an extent that I can purify everything. That is how I explained in great detail in my previous session. That essence at the source, that is what I am and that essence is present within myself and awareness of that inner presence can transform someone's life radically and after that transformation has taken place, neither should the one undergoing transformation stigmatize himself nor should others stigmatize such a person. And that's why it, is, it was fairly common to then revere and worship such individuals who had a very negative past, a very bad past, but if they experienced this transformation, they became great sages, great saints in all different parts of the world. I mean, even if you just remember the story, for example, of Mary Magdalena you know, in, in Christianity, it takes us to the same point.
point, you know. And yet, as a society, we, op we often stigmatize such evil persons, which is the point here that should not be done. Patanjali would call it upekha, forgiveness. You know, when he speaks of uh, chitta prasadana, finding peace within the mind content, within the mind content, he uses, he, he speaks of friendliness towards all, compassion towards all, and joyfulness towards those who are committing good deeds, and forgiveness towards those who have committed atrocious deeds. That is what he calls Ubekha. In Buddhism it is called Ubekha. The Buddha also places tremendous importance on this. <clears throat> so the general outlook of the yogic teachings in this context has always been that it doesn't matter uh, if a person has committed the most atrocious deeds in his life, the fire of wisdom is such that it completely purifies the body, mind, intellect, heart and memories of such an individual. Shri Krishna expresses this idea in the Bhagavad Gita twice in very strong words that even if you are a greater sinner than the greatest sinner, such kind of language uh, he uses, or if you have committed bad deeds to the most possible, worst, worst possible level, such kinds of words he uses, still then such a person should be considered a sadhu. Sadhu means a good person, a nice person, a very good person. If this fire of knowledge has burned away all their impurities. Yes? And in this statement, um, does the Gita or Upanishads make the difference that there is in Buddhism, you know, between the acts but the intentions, you know, like they say, you can use the knife to try to save somebody's life as a surgeon and then kill this person, and the intention was to save, and same knife to just kill someone in the intention of killing. Yes. Because this prostitute was a prostitute out of the pressure of society, exactly. not necessarily exactly. because... Exactly. Is it stated yes. somewhere in the Gita, this distinction? The intention always uh, plays uh, uh, a very, very important role. Uh, what a person does and how he does it. Um, isn't it, you know, that even Patanjali, when he says that either doing it yourself, making others to do it, or even just applauding, you know, applauding, so that is, that is a form of intention. When you, when you, yes, approving. When you approve someone else's bad deeds, you know. So it is not that clearly, I can't now remember that clearly being expressed. It is certainly implied, and uh, uh, always intention plays a key role. And that is why I think that. Uh, uh, let me think a little bit more on this, on this question. Because this is an interesting question, whether uh, this this importance of intention, uh, this because this dichotomy between usually the idea always is that if you have a good intention, you will do a good work. And the very definition of what would be the the, the the opposite of this. Usually, if you have a good intention, then you do a good work. But can you do a bad work out of bad intention? What would be the uh, what would be the example of uh, commit doing a bad work with a good intention? Well, isn't it? I, I heard a story. Uh, a young man uh, went to uh, some insects on, her, on his father's head, and uh, but the young man didn't have wisdom. He used an uh, axe. Yeah, that's the, the famous. Insects. Yes, that's uh, that's the famous Panchatantra story. So it's a good intention, but did bad. 
a king, the king, the king had uh, the king had monkey as his best friend, and uh, his monkey always used to fan him when he was sleeping. One day, the monkey saw a, a net sitting on the king's neck, and uh, he, the monkey, always wanted to by the fan, you know, send it away, but it was not going away, coming back again and again, the fly. Eventually the monkey becomes so, un so angry and the sword which was lying there, he, the monkey takes the sword and <laughs> tries to hit the net or the fly with the sword which was sitting on the neck of the king. <laughs> and so <laughs> the king gets killed. So, good intention and bad result. <laughs> bad result. But my question is, bad work. Bad work with good intention. Is this, uh, is this uh, really... A, a butcher? Yeah. Like, we, I think most of us are vegetarian here because we pursue the idea of Ahimsa everywhere. Yes. But some people, they are butchers, and I really don't think we can say it's a nice word, but they do it because their intention is to feed their family yeah. and to just earn money yeah. and not because they want to be killing animals. or It's an ugly work. I don't think any butcher could say, hmm, I love having my hands full of blood every day. Yeah. So maybe this... Again, in that case, uh, uh, his work will be considered good work in the Mahabharata understanding. That's why one of the five Gitas uh, in the Mahabharata is the Gita of the butcher, in which the butcher, in fact, is, is, is the teacher and a great scholar who had studied all the Vedas but failed to live them and understand their application in day-to-day -day life. Despite being a great scholar, he failed to understand that he was sent by his by by someone by by someone's wife to whom he had come asking for arms and then she challenges him and then she says that you are a great scholar but you have not understood dharma in its practical significance and then sends him to a butcher so uh, then since the intention is good, even a bad work would be defined in the Mahabharata, in the Gita, as a good work. So that's slightly when we deal with this dichotomy uh, between considering bad work with good intentions, what I think uh, the Mahabharata approach, the Upanishadic approach there seems to be that if then, because uh, I think that is one of the most important points that Mahabharata tries to make, is that dharma, righteousness, and adharma, unrighteousness, are not clear, as clear as black and white. It's a continuum, and many times what, ap what apparently seems like unrighteous is in fact righteous, and what is clad in the garb of righteousness depending on what the intention there is, it becomes, it is in fact unrighteousness. So Mahabharata, through the complexities of its stories, really tries to define righteousness and unrighteousness like this by showing how complex it becomes. So for example, in fact, uh, one of the Mahabharata stories, you know, where Sage Veda Vyasa gives birth to the children of uh, Pandu, Dhritarashtra and Viduna, Vidura by meeting with the wives of his younger brothers. Now this is, uh, to, to have a relationship with the wife of your brothers is something completely unacceptable. But the point is that under, circumst un under certain circumstances in which he happened to be there, it was the correct thing to do. So like this, the Mahabharata story shows that it's not always as clear as good and bad. You know? So what the Buddha gives more importance on intention. Yes? <laughs> Coming back uh, to the question that you asked, uh, 
I think here what we, what we would say is, one of my teachers, he used to say that uh, uh, ahimsa, <laughs> non-violence, which is translated as non-violence, of course, one grammatical theory is that it is derived from the root hymns, which means to commit violence. And therefore, ahimsa simply means non-violence. But there is another grammatical theory behind this word, which is that hinsa has been derived from the root han, which means to kill, and sa, this suffix, which is a common Sanskrit suffix, meaning implying desire, himsa means the desire to kill, and ahimsa therefore would mean the absence of the desire to kill. You know, so the, in, this, in this sense, it's not always violence, but it is whether we had the desire to commit violence or not, the intention to commit violence or not. So yes, a, 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 the sages of ancient India used to walk on this planet Earth in such a way so that they avoided killing even the tiny little insects. They did this. There's a common saying, Sadhu chale paiya paiya chetin ko bachayake. The sadhu, the good human beings, walk every step avoiding the ants so that they don't kill. And yet they get killed. What then? But then it is still ahimsa because the intention of killing was not there. They tried their best avoid killing them, and yet if it happens, then what? It's still ahimsa, because the intention of killing was not there. So, uh, in this way, uh, in several places that uh, implication, it is implied, what you were asking is implied, but whether the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads explicitly mention it, the way, of the, the, way the Buddha has mentioned it in his teachings, it has not, as far as I remember now, it has not been mentioned. And the reason is that under such circumstances, even what is considered wrong, a wrong act, would be considered a right act, if the intention is right. And the whole philosophy you know, of the Upanishads is extremely positive. No? It's extremely positive. We have all those extreme examples of um, Trikatu, that you Trishanku, yes. Trishanku, yes. sorry, yes. and this prostitute, and you see all those examples of society that are completely yes. extreme, and yes. somehow yes. they become models of wisdom. Exactly, exactly. So it's about the exactly. whole general idea of kindness. Continuing. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, uh, for example, uh, Guru Granth Sahib, you know the the sacred uh, book of which has now become the sacred book of Sikhism. It's really nothing but the quintessence of the Upanishadic teachings, mostly presented mostly in Hindi language, but partly also in, in, in ancient Punjabi and some in ancient Persian as well. It has been collected and uh, it is a collection of uh, hundreds of masters' teachings. Most of them were uh, Hindus and a few of them were also Sufi mystics. And uh, it was in the 15th century when Guru Arjan Dev Ji, uh, the fifth master of the Sikh tradition, and uh, I'm saying Sikh tradition because it was not yet identified as a different religion. Uh, the identification as a different religion came only with the 10th master. But the first nine masters were very much part of uh, the wider Indian Hindu scriptures, teachings and everything. The clear distinction uh, was not there. And that's why it is... Uh, Guru Granth Sahib is really a very beautiful text and it, this discussion reminds me of something that uh, <coughs> when Guru Arjun Dev Ji, he was uh, collecting the teachings of all the great saints and sages of his time and of the previous centuries to collect together this sacred 
book which has now become the sacred book of Sikhism. If you go to Amritsar, that is the book which has been worshipped there. When he collected, he also collected uh, from several great uh, devotees and he collected one song from Surdas. Surdas is uh, the greatest poet of Hindi literature and a great devotee, he was blind. Also lived approximately in the 15th century. And, uh, but he, he collected one song by him, which is there in the book, but he left out one particular passage there. And that, why he left out that particular passage and what that particular passage is, is very interesting. What Surdas says, and Surdas is talking about himself, uh, you know, the devotees sometimes, they, they have beautiful songs in which they really put themselves down below the earth, showing how bad they are, how, you know, like this. And so in this song, he sings about himself and he says that Suradas Khal Kali Chavar Chadhana Dujo Rang which means that Suradas is such a bad person and he is like a black blanket on which you cannot put any other color. It cannot be colored by any other color. Because it, it is already black. If it would have been a white blanket, then you could color it with any color. And so Surdas is like that black blanket, which cannot be colored by any other color. And this was the passage that Guru Arjun Dev Ji decided to leave out, not to include, because simply because he did not want to stigmatize. And this smells of stigmatization, you know, that a bad person is like a black blanket on which no other color can be pasted. You know, it's stigmatization, it's hopeless. Now there is no hope at all. And this is an idea that Guru Arjan Dev Ji did not want to include into his teachings and that's why he left it out. So, and uh, Guru Granth Sahib is, uh, is, is beautiful because it contains the wisdom of the Upanishads and uh, the devotion of uh, the medieval times and that uh, uh, approach of the lover and the beloved which is in the devotional traditions as well as found amongst the Sufi mystics. That's why it is. It is a beautiful, beautiful work. Yes, yeah, Chadariya Jini Rechia. Yes, yes. Surdasa songs are very, very famous. The other side, every day in the evening, they sing Surdasa song. This is Duryodhan ki meva tyagi. All that, that, that is. Sabse unchi prem sagai. The marriage in love is the greatest love of all. The greatest marriage of all marriages. Such kinds of songs which they sing in the other side. You know, in the evening prayer. So, that they are all from Surdas. And he was the greatest poet of Hindi literature, great devotee <coughs> from Vrindavan. But this particular passage was not included because it smells of stigmatization, which uh, Guru Arjan Dev Ji did not want to include. So, no, no matter what, one should always be given a second chance. One last thing that uh, I wanted to mention about this Urdhva Pavitra, that I am pure from above. What does this above mean? I often think if there is any connection between uh, Namaskara Mudra in Vrikshasana, you know, when you do Vrikshasana and uh, we are doing Namaskara, Urdhva Namaskara, particularly in Vrikshasana, you know, because we were talking about Vriksha here, and then uh, you see this Urdhva Namaskara, doing Namaskara above. <laughs> wonder if there is any connection between that. Because, uh, whether you do Namaskara 
in front of you, like in Namaskarasana, whether you do Urdhva Namaskara or whether you do <laughs> Paschim Namaskara. Yes. In the beginning of your talk, you uh, remind the fact of the postures with the back, something with the back. Yes. And what is the word? Prishtha. Yes. Prishtha. So yes. I, this is also a question, uh, and I think now something that you have said now is connected to the answer. Yeah. Uh, the, what is the connection between our past? Uh, deeds yes. that uh, shouldn't be considered as uh, uh, to finish us like this, but we can always change. Yeah. Uh, what is the connection about the posture and the back and the back uh, thing? You said that the posture is uh, straight, stretching the back yeah. and yeah. going forward. Going forward, yes. So I think that the answer is some, somewhere connected to this uh, thing, and this is also connected. Yeah, yeah, this uh, stretching. I think, uh, first of all, our back is the most neglected part, you know. It's the most neglected part, we, and it's the unknown part. Okay. It's, it's really the unknown and the neglected, because we are so much aware of our front body. But uh, so little aware of uh, of our back body. But uh, the question comes, you know, the moment you start uh, uh, up, then is there something up? And what does this up stand for? You know, is this up? Because again, up and down, they are relative. You know, and that's why ultimately it doesn't matter whether you you do namaskara folding in front of your hands, in front of your heart, showing that uh, with, my, with my karma yoga, bhakti yoga and jnana yoga, I bow down to you, or whether we are doing urdhva namaskara, or whether we are doing paschim namaskara. Wherever we do namaskara, we are, ba we are bowing down to the same essence. But what do we mean by this word urdhva, up? You know, that the consciousness this pure consciousness is high up. What does this mean? Does, usually the moment we hear the word up, we start looking up. Does it mean that it is somewhere up there? What does it mean? But you see, we have to see <coughs> something that is higher up requires effort. Requires effort. One has to work hard. One has to make effort to reach there. And uh, down is where we fall, you know, without making any effort. We just, we just, so anything that is acquired with effort that can be metaphorically pointed at as being up and I think that is the only way how we can explain, you know. And uh, because due to, the, due to the practice of yoga, it requires tremendous effort to achieve this inner, to reach this inner peaceful center. That is why that can be referred to as up and that which is completely, that, uh, that which removes us away from that inner center of peace, that would be down. So down and up would be, can be taken as metaphors for what is within and what is without. So if our awareness is away from ourselves, it is down, it is out, if it is within ourselves, then it is up, it is within. These are just metaphors and they should just remain metaphors with a limited explanation. Otherwise, ultimately, uh, this experience is the most effortless of all. And that's why the masters ultimately would say that it is the same essence which is high up and which is also down there, which is within, which is 
without. But why are they inspiring us to come within? Because that is where it is easiest to be experienced. Within the space of the heart. And once it is experienced there, once the awareness comes within there, then the awareness of its presence in everybody else and in everything else comes naturally. But first, they always, that is why, because that is why they always inspire their listeners to pull themselves back to the inner center, their attention, their awareness, the whole practice of asana, pranayama, pratyahana, dharana, dhyana. This eight limbed path of yoga is all about drawing back to this inner center, all climbing up to this innocent and up simply because it requires effort even though after having made all the effort someone realizes that it is the most effortless thing to be achieved simply as you know this I think uh, one last story that my teacher and I tell this repeatedly but it sort of sums up what I'm trying to say you know, that uh, once a student went to his teacher and said, Sir, I want to become enlightened. What should I do? Give me the sadhanas which I can do to become enlightened. I want to be enlightened like the Buddha, like the rishis of the Upanishads. The teacher says, Boy, you cannot do anything. There is nothing you can do about it. You can only do as much as you can do for the sun to rise. Can you do anything for the sun to rise? Can you toil? Can you, can you help the sun in rising? Can you do anything? Can you? He said, no. There is nothing I can do. In the same way, you cannot do anything for your enlightenment. Oh, wow. That's an insight. <laughs> I cannot do anything for my enlightenment. But then, why all these yoga classes, pranayama classes, meditation practices, vipassana, it's such a big business today. <laughs> what are these people doing? All this, 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 that is all, so that you don't fall asleep when the sun is rising. <laughs> so it's beautifully sums up, you know, the need of working tremendously hard for something that is the most effortlessly achievable state of our being, which is not something that can be artificially brought about. Because, you know, we always think, okay, when we study, we become a scholar. When we study psychology, we become uh, a great psychologist. When we study philosophy, we become great philosophers. When we practice yoga, we become great yogis, you know. So similarly, when we... we what, what is it? which we do so that we become great enlightened beings. You know, our mind works in the same way by practicing yoga, by doing meditation, by doing this and that, and we keep on doing and running things, running behind these, these things. But they help nothing. They only help by awakening us in that moment when the sun rises so that we can experience the beauty of that sunrise. And the higher you go, the higher you reach. I always wanted to climb uh, several different mountains, you know, for example, I wanted to see uh, the sunrise or sunset from Mount uh, Sinai, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that there, and that is one of my dreams, then Mount Agung, which is now, uh, you know, Iraq. yeah, now it's, uh, it's, 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 it's erupting, so I always wanted to climb up there just to see the sunrise or sunset because it's so beautiful from high up there so all the effort I'm all the effort that I'm making is just to raise to the to the vantage point where I can enjoy the beauty of the sunrise but none of my effort affects the sunrise in any way the same thing is true about so when we speak of up down, effort, effortlessness, we have to keep this grander picture 
in our mind. And so the point that I was trying to make was that up simply means that which is achieved through tremendous effort. And down is that which just happens naturally. And mostly what happens naturally is if we, if we don't guide it with awareness, if we don't guide it with wisdom, if we don't guide it with understanding, mostly what happens is harmful to ourselves and harmful for others. But when we guide our life with awareness, with understanding, with mindfulness, with wisdom, then tremendous amount of hard work is required. That is up. So that which lies up, which means lies, the awareness of which lies as at the result of tremendous hard work, without being affected by that hard work. It's simply like looking at the sunrise from the top of a mountain, that's all. So but tremendous effort is required. So, <coughs> Uh, the first, I think the first three steps in, we, can, we have analyzed, the first step was breaking identification with the physical as well as the subtle body. The second step was further breaking identification with the accumulated labels. And the third step, Urdhva Pavitra, was the step of finding peace within the heart through forgiveness, through forgiveness to oneself and through forgiveness to others. Urdhva Pavitra, the recognition of that pure essence within oneself and within all, within all, is what inspires one to reach that forgiveness towards oneself and towards others. That forgiveness is the third step to find peace within oneself. So this is, the this is the third step which we discussed today. Now the fourth step, which is the awareness of oneness with the universe, with the universe out there, with the material universe, experiencing one's oneness with the material as well as the spiritual universe. That is what uh, the next step will be about, which we will discuss in our next session. We conclude today, still a few questions. I did not, uh, was already started asking questions before. So, but still if there are any questions. You wanted to say something, I forgot about that. Yes. In the Mercy so, yes. whereas it's like the intention, people say it's very good, but then some people say it's, in spirituality they say it's not good. So, yeah, so Merc the, the problem, the, there are two things, mercy killing uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, when we put down animals, other animals, that is a difficult debate, because that is then the biggest question is, does the animal really want that or not? There is no way for us uh, to know whether the animal really, or does the animal, despite its pain, wants, does it want to continue? Animal so, or even now human beings? Yeah, yeah with human beings, I think uh, that uh, there were certain, even though as we generally know that Atmahatya self, suicide is considered a very great uh, atrocity in the traditions, there were several uh, certain circumstances in which it was in fact permitted. And it was in fact permitted. And one of those circumstances was when there was an incurable disease, a disease which cannot be cured, which is just making uh, one's life a misery. And in that moment, if he decides to give up their life as a result of that, as a well thought. It should not be a momentary impulse, but as a well thought, then it is not considered bad. But it's really difficult to find out if that is being misused in these days. Yes, yes, yes. So the per person yes. performing that act also has to be a real good uh, Yeah, yeah. 
it should be very much uh, uh, the person's own decision and uh, uh, I would say that you know if someone is just suffering because of cancer and simply because they want to die but the, 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 the court is not allowing them to die. I still yeah. have never been able to make up my mind right. what is right and what is wrong, but uh, uh, the fact that, for example, Switzerland allows uh, you to take such... in Singapore? In Singapore. Uh, in, in India, it's not a no. In India, at any cost, to the last moment, even if it if it literally means you to torture to death, to torture to death, because that's how, I, for example, my teacher, you know, Swamidhyan and Maharaj, how he was literally tortured to death, you know, the last moments, just trying to save him, trying to save him, you know, by putting several of my friends said, this is not good, this is not good, the last on the ventilator, you know, all the different parts of of your body being pierced by external things and then uh, this uh, this so is you in India we have this uh, how it is called so like Surajana? Yeah, yeah, that that uh, in Jainism we have it very strong. In Jainism it is very strongly there. In the, the, I had once a very uh, detailed discussion on, on my Facebook page on this and uh, several people beautifully contributed also from the scriptural viewpoint and that is when I was made aware that several scriptures, like in Jainism of course, uh, Santhara, yeah. Santhara where you fast unto death, which is considered a way, and that is, yeah, completely fast unto death. That's uh, that's that's all. That is uh, actually the problem here. Yeah. Person who is yeah. suffering is not in a position to take a decision. Yeah. Most of the time, that's the case. That's the case. Yes. But they are they are really taking uh, santhara. Yeah. They yeah. Take it, uh, the with awareness. With awareness. And there, with santhara, in most cases, uh, the decision is taken in full awareness. And then all by of this is they the full support, they fully support it, everybody supports it. But the government doesn't. And as you remember, last few years this has been a, a debate. You know, the government really wants to intervene there because the court thinks that it's a form of suicide because you are fasting unto death. And there is a lot of uh, discussion going on around that. Complications come in, like the person doesn't want to spend money on his medical treatment. Some doctors think, okay, it can be cured. You have to give them a chance. So there are many, many complications. Start. But Complicated. yeah, but then simply because someone does not want to use medicines, yes. which is a very common thing in India yeah. even today, I identified that because me, with my father, at any cost, he would never ever take allopathic medicine. He just wouldn't. And there was there was a there was a time in 2010 when he was in bed for two years, and once I remember, he said that if anything happens in Tharta, then don't take me to, to the hospital, just make me lie down next to the Ganga. That's the best you can do, but don't take me to the hospital. This, these, these were his words. So, India like this, trying to save somebody, torturing them until the moment of death, it's also meddling with life and death. Meddling with life. So if you're not allowed to mercy kill somebody, then sh you shouldn't be allowed to torture to death somebody. Exactly. That's the debate. Yeah, that's the debate. Yes. 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 No, okay, if someone uh, is close to death because they had an accident and they are in the age of 40, 50, there you would want to do everything to save them because they still have a life ahead. You know, so there it is fine, but if somebody is already 85 and has been sick, and then just trying to prolong them the life by a few moments or by a few hours, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. Then the law is getting too far. Then it's not helping uh, the individual, but it's... Yeah. yeah. We, we cannot take those. Yeah, it's the most difficult. 
it would be extremely hard. Yes. And the society will say, why didn't you take your father to the hospital? So then you have to, you know, others will say, why you haven't taken, you were not a good son because you didn't take care of him when he needed to go to the hospital, you didn't take him, you know. So you sort of struggle between these two uh, uh, extremes, yeah. I mean, he made it very clear what he wanted. Yeah, he made it very clear. You know, my parents too told me if they were on machines and all that that uh, I, they should not be kept alive. Yes. So, uh, yes. So he made it very clear. Yes. I did have to make a decision on my father, and uh, he, he lasted about an hour or two, and then he passed. And then uh, my mother, we, my father, and I went home to think about it. And when we were about to leave the house, they called us and told us that my mother had died on the machines. Mm -hmm. so, but she didn't, neither one of them did, wanted to be kept alive if that's the artificial way. Yes. Yes. See the same thing that we do too, so because of the... Yeah, same thing. He didn't want to go to the hospital because he said very clearly, I will not live a long time now. But then because of the family, he didn't want it that afterwards they feel they, they have to suffer. Yeah. So, so Eventually he, he accepted, accepted it. Accepted. So, okay. Although he, he said very clearly uh, he doesn't want these uh, aggressive uh, treatments. Uh, so. Yeah, anything else? I, I know in Singapore they have special hospital just for taking care of the dying uh, patients. So they will fully uh, respect the, their decision. What they can do only like uh, re reduce their pain reduce. or make them comfortable, but they don't, uh, um, yeah, fully respect. Their this is what, uh, for example, Gita Ji's mother. You know, Gita Ji is a, is a person living in Swami Rama's ashram, and her mother. Oh, I really loved her so much. She, uh, she suddenly she when she came to do for she was from Manipur, you know, which is northeast region, and. Uh, old uh, village woman but a deep devotee of, of Lord Krishna and she came to do her four dhams, you know, the pilgrimage of the four sacred places and when she went back to Haridwar they suddenly discovered that she had colon cancer and uh, uh, it, was, it was still in an early stage, the doctor said uh, uh, we can cut out that part of the colon and you can be saved she was around 65 or 68 or something like this and she, she decided not to get operated. And uh, she lived for the next six, seven, eight months here in Rishikesh, in Swami Ram Sadhagram. After every class, I used to go to her just to visit her. And she was, uh, she was, she was in a lot of pain, but she was very peaceful very, very peaceful. Always, whenever I used to go there, with a big smile, you know, and uh, doing her japa, and always so, so loving, so kind. In the last 15, 20 days, she was, uh, she started experiencing uh, extreme pain. When then uh, Ganga Prem Hospice, the doctors from there helped in pain management. So she just took some pills to reduce the pain, that's all. And uh, she left very peacefully. You know, I know she was also around 80. Yes. And uh, she was also very sick. And uh, it was so beautiful. And uh, she was next to my room. So I used to go every day. Leaving. I used to go. And, so, and she, she used to tell me uh, that very far, there's a very far light. She can see from very far. And she was so happy, you know, because she goes closer and closer. And then, uh, unfortunately, they put her in the hospital. And then, uh, of course, they gave a lot of medicine. And then, all the, you know, then they, they gave her artificial food and babies. And then all these things uh, disappeared. She, she never saw the light again. And she never talked about it. And then I felt, I felt so bad about yeah. it, you know. Because she was really uh, 
you know, she was so happy that she's going closer and closer uh, towards that light. And uh, noticing all these drugs that were visiting me today made her into darkness, you know? So. I'm very glad that we are discussing death. <laughs> and it's, uh, and it's, it's really very important that we very often do because mm -hmm. in societies now, even in Indian society and in the West, we see that it's, it's, a, it's a subject which we try to avoid and yet it is a reality which by discussing it, in fact, uh, what, what we realize is that it's, it's, a rea it's a reality and it's an event which the mystics look forward to. You know, if you look at the songs of Kabir or several great mystics, they, they beautifully sing about that inevitable moment, which when it comes naturally, it is not what we fear it is, but it is a very beautiful moment. We can let go of the fear, it is very important, in complete peace. In, in light, in peace, in happiness, in joy. And I see that with several persons known to me now in their old age, these teachings, when they have really uh, introduced them in their lives, live by these principles, they are so joyful about this. They speak jo so joyfully, positively about what is inevitably going to come. And I think that is beautiful. Whenever I look them, whenever I hear them, I just feel that, okay, when I'm at your age, I just would want to, would want to be like this. For example, Raj. When he comes to, to, to Ganga Sadhan and he stays here, he says, I never lock my room uh, uh, when I'm sleeping inside so that you guys will not have to break in. <laughs> Yeah, I can. Enlightened man, really enlightened. <laughs> Truly enlightened. <laughs> In Buddhism, they think uh, before dying, if you see the sign of light, it's a very good sign. It's, yes. it's show, it means you are going to reverse in a uh, divine realm. Yes. It's very it's, good. It's a wonderful it's sign. I said very, very bad afterwards. Yes. When I saw, uh, this reminds me of one, one accident which happened in, in Himachal Pradesh and, uh, and they were bringing out these bodies, uh, young girls, you know, but they were, they were dead. But you could, you could see the fear on their face, you know, with round, round uh, lips and everything like that. In that moment they were petrified. You know, it, was, it was the most horrible thing to look at. So this, those last moments, how frightened they would have been. That is, uh, that is very frightening. Yes, yes. last. We were talking about essence, about death and fear. I used to say a lot, I'm so grateful of my life, what I have. I say that maybe I do not have any pity, whatever, if I'm going to die. I say so a lot. And then it was fun as it happened to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was taking a bath. Actually, it's very nice bath. <laughs> I always choose a movie, whatever I like. And preparing everything beautiful, comfortable, and then I <laughs> sleep in a bath. And it was fun there. <laughs> it was, and, but you know, a lot of people die when they had taken a bath. <laughs> Yes, yes, a lot of accidents, but I was in that situation. 
also the future look like not so hot, <laughs> so so. You know, not that like that. And then I try to climb it up just because I want to be a look more, look better for my last picture in my life. <laughs> Discussion on death in our previous, in our next class. <laughs> if we are still alive, by then, which most likely we will be. <laughs> we never know. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's very uh, different from scientific because before I work, before I work for cardiovascular uh, medical.